All right, let's take you straight live there now, where, of course, uh, the Tumble Foundation, where Dr. John Cunney already uh, virtually delivering the seventh annual Oliver Tumble Memorial Lecture. The theme is Arts and Culture as a Mechanism for Liberation. We call the conspiracy of silence. The economic uh, boom in South Africa among the white population was unbelievable. Every person had a holiday home. The rent was 73 cents of the South African rent to one dollar. And these were the days that there was extreme activity within the community and extreme poverty among our people. And these are the moments that shaped us as the youth into finding a voice for ourselves. I was on my way to study law as my, el my uncle, who was like my brother, Ustre Lokani, had just been arrested and sent to Robben Island. And then I heard that my father said, I can't have you go to invest it, I don't have the money, you're going to have to do something else, look for a job, and maybe when you've raised enough money, you can continue to go and do the law thing that you want to do. And then I heard about the serpent players, about No Menchinga, Welcome, Duhu, Shakam, Gukula, George, they were part of a group called the serpent players. Nom Shenkonyeni with Fes Bukholan said to me, oh, you acted at school. I said, yes, could you come and join us? We're doing a production called Antigone by Sophocles. I walked into this room and there was a white man I passed on the, on the entrance who I assumed was the caretaker of the hall. And he had his pipe and his brown jersey with the elbows showing. I thought it was some poor white, you know, standing at the door. We got in and I was introduced to, this is Arthur Fugger, this is John Carney. The play was Antigone and the question was asked, if the law is unjust, do people have a right to oppose it and not to obey it? Which emanates from the fact that two brothers in Antigone died in the same battle, each killed by each other's hand. But the king decides that the one who died defending the state will have a ceremonial burial with all the noble rights due to him. But the other one who fought against the state, against feudalism, against dictatorship, will be left unburied to be food of the jackals and the carrion fly. We all agreed that day that this is the theater that we think we should be bringing. Prior to that, we had done a lot of great plays by Chuck Chekhov, great plays by Brecht, great plays by Shakespeare, great plays by Camus, which made us feel very educated because we spoke very good English with an incredible accent. And this time, we also performed at the St. Stephen's Church Hall with about 200 chairs, and yet we always had about 18 or 20 people coming to see because one or somebody must be outside to look at the special branch, doesn't stop, and everybody would run out. But when we put on this play, this play, we push through this, in this message that the law, that there are laws that come from God, and they are more important than the laws that come from men. It was then that it struck in me that there is another role for the arts other than doing plays to be famous and popular and maybe one day, I don't know when, make a little bit of money. It was that time exactly that we realized that we are people who have a struggle and that struggle is for liberation and we are not exempt from that struggle simply because we call ourselves artists. The problem with being an artist is that when you've done with your little play, you fall within the apartheid rules, apartheid discrimination. You have to carry a passbook. While I was doing my metric, I think I was arrested four times for forgetting the passbook. And each time my father had to pay five rand or five days to get me out. It was a miracle I passed the metric. And then, we, as we were doing this play, uh, Antigone, one of the actors, Shark Ngukul, a teacher, an incredible actor, but no memory whatsoever, could not remember a line. So my job was to stand behind him and feed him his lines, which made me know the whole play in order to assist him. One day, Shark didn't come to rehearsals. He was gone, arrested spent seven years on Robben Island, I had to step in and perform the Haman in the play. But then we heard from my brother and the others that Shark was doing a one-man performance 
of Antigone on Robben Island during lunch. The biggest joke was, how could he? He doesn't know the words. So how could he do this? And then it was then again in 1966 that many of the serpent players were already, some of them arrested, you know, uh, were on, on Robben Island. And that we attending uh, Norman Chinga's uh, 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 trial in Credoc. Athol went there to speak on character. I don't know how it helped him. That's exactly why he was found guilty. But where Mabel, Norman's wife, was there. And just before Norman's trial began, an elderly gentleman in his late 60s took over this heavy coat and said, see, see you from New Brighton. Take this coat to 33 Mandy Street in New Brighton. Give it to my wife. Tell her I got 15 years and tell her to wait for me. Mabel took the coat to 33 Mandy Street and was met by an elderly lady with gray hair, very dignified and beautiful. And she was 69 years old. When Mabel handed over the coat, the lady said, oh, thank God, my husband got 15 years. Others got the rope in Pretoria. Others were sentenced to life. He will come back. And then we stopped and said, what happens to the coat? That was the birth of protest theater. That was the birth of the liberation theater. That was the birth of what we call relevant theater. And that coat made us workshop the conditions and circumstances where they will have to part with the coat. It was from there on that we decided that no more shall we do a theater for theater's sake, art for art's sake. We have to understand that our role was critical and important within our own community. We have to understand that we as artists hold a mirror to our own community. What they see in the mirror, they may like or they may argue, they may not like. That's not the purpose or the role of the artist. The artists have held the mirror that this community must see itself. It was then that also we attracted another force of the security police into the work we do. And suddenly we were being disrupted in our rehearsals and performances by these absolutely brutal policemen, and some of them were black. Stopping performances, grabbing scripts, and finding out what this is about, why have you changed this? It was then in 1972 that we created Sizwe Banzi is Dead, which again was born out of the fact that a black man has to find work. But he lives in King Williamstown, in the rural area of Zawanon Tampa. Incidentally, that's where Winston Jonah comes from. Arriving in Port Elizabeth, he's endorsed out that he does not belong to the urban area of Port Elizabeth. He must go back. He can't go back because the wife said, if you don't bring in food, we will die. And in the middle of that search, we found out that he could stay, but he had a decision to make. Is he prepared to sacrifice his own identity, his own humanity, and assume the ID or reference book of a dead person who has the right stamp and right conditions to remain in Port Elizabeth? That opened up the world. In one performance in Cape Town, we got an invitation immediately to take this play to England. We sat down again and we said, what would be the point? What would this play mean among the English? What is really telling our story to the English? At that time, we were so politicized and so happy and powerful and proud about the work we do. In fact, if we put in a play, Lulu, and the policeman did not stop it, we went back to the drawing board and says, we've got to find a word. Well, that's going to make the policeman angry. That's going to make the white man not like the work we do. And some of the words were very simple. Release Nelson Mandela. That was it. Place banned. Let over Tambo and the exiles come home. That was it. Once the play was banned, the booking shot up. During the waiting for passports and all to go to England, we then created the island, which was based on the fact that I told you that when Shaq Mkukula was on Robben Island, he was doing a one-man performance of, Robin, of, the, of, of Antigone for the island inmates. So the island was created as a keyhole 
for our people outside to see what's going on on that island, which at that time we called the University of Life. We all wished to be arrested so that we could go to Robben Island. So if it meant that we have to do a serious crime, we were ready to do it. But the greater honor would be to be hanged or to be killed for what you believed in. We believe that that would mean my family, my life has been worth something. We then prepared to get our passports. Winston got his passports early. Arthur Fugger got his passport. I didn't get mine until about three weeks before we go. And finally, through the intervention of the Royal Court Theatre, Lord Soames and Lord Sainsbury, people with that the theatre people knew, I found a travelling document which defined my nationality as unbepalled, undeterminable. Because I refused to take on the C-Sky passports, which then would mean I would write to a tra South African travel document. And that's how I traveled. But that was very little of our problems. Arriving in London, immediately, there was a silence. There's nobody communicating with us. Nobody even asking. The publicity was all over the place. And then we heard that the organization, the anti-apartheid, the internal structures in London are still kind of doing some research on these two black young men and this white man. And then we were invited to Africa Center in Covent Garden. We got in there, Winston and I sat down, and there was the Council of Liberation. Lionel Ngakani, Louis Ngos, there was uh, Dennis Brutus, and there was um, <laughs> all the kind of... Go Blok Modisani, and there was also a, a representative from the organization, and there was another representative from the organization, and all they asked, tell us how this work came about. So we gave them the story of how this work was created, where we come from, and they said, okay. The following day, the entire 12 weeks that the Royal Court was sold out, there were even uh, displays of artwork and photographs and by Dumile and then musicians outside, uh, Dudu Pukwane, all the people came together, the Manhattan brothers, Joe Mukhozi, they came and supported this project. The anti appointed even had the desk in front of the theater. But the greatest award, Lulu, that I've ever received as an actor, was being told at the end of that performance that there were two people who'd like to see me outside. I went outside, it was the grand old man, O.R. Tambo, and the Mamu Adelaide Tambo. And he looked at us with Winston and said, thank you. And his famous line, what you did tonight, what you did tonight is what we've been trying to do over the 30 years we've been in exile showing the English audiences, the politicians, the people who have been trying, the business people, the evil of this apartheid system, the inhumanity the in, of it. And people came out of there feeling and asking questions, what can we do? What can we do? It is then that Owar said to Winston and I, you are recognized as part of the struggle for liberation. He said to us, your names will be found in Dar es Salaam in this register of those who worked very hard for the liberation of our country. That was the biggest gift to Winston and I. We walked around high heels and saying that we've been recognized. Our names are in Dar es Salaam. <laughs> and of course, it then opened the international community. When the plays moved to America, we were there, received by Tamim Klambiso, by Inogomo, by Obrinkomo, by all the the, 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 the representatives, the uh, uh, Hosizile was there, you know, Professor Willy Hosizile, the ANC received us. And here was a problem. We didn't think that would be a problem when we go home. We win the Tony Award on Broadway, and then Best Actor. I look at Winston, he says, what are we going to say? And I said, I'm going to say thank you. I'm not going to say I thank my mother, I thank God, I thank Jesus, I thank my agent, I thank my club director, I thank my producer. I just said, thank you. And Winston did it even shorter, thanks. We walked off, stunned audiences. For the first time, two actors received the Tony Award, and they were from Africa for the first time on Broadway. 
We are right back in South Africa. Oh, well. And suddenly, we immediately got detained. Because of a review by Clive Barnes in the New York Times that said this is the heaviest indictment on the evil, illegal, poor government of South Africa. Now I'm sitting there in Sunland being interrogated by Ruben Max and Nivot about what is this play about. I said the, 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 the crit is not a play. It's a review by somebody who saw the play. There's nothing in the play that says that. And he used all the F words following that I needed to shut up. It was from that moment that we realized that we have an extra role, a duty to play. Wherever we went from traveled around the world, I was sitting in my detention cell in Tata. After 15 days, the prison warden, white, kept saying to me, and don't jump out of that window. Don't hang yourself. You people have a tendency to do that and claim the special branch for hanging you. He was planting in my head that I'm here forever, and the only exit was to take my life. And one day, a black water slid under the door a piece of paper, which when I opened it, it had an article in London. It had the pictures of Owar Tambo, the pictures of all the, the, all the people in London. It had all the top actors demanding in front of the South Africa House, release John Carney, release Winston Chona. After 15 days was the first time I slept that night because I said, they can't kill me anymore. The world knows they have me. And that immediately made us relook at the role of the artist to understand that we have a special gift, that gift with this communication, that gift with creating images and being the gift of people, giving people exactly what we believe they feel and interact with. We have no solutions, but we create this possibility of a dialogue beginning. We create the possibility of engaging with our audiences and finding an opportunity to interact with each other. And everywhere we were, I remember when we were in Australia, we were called the Oar Tambo Boys. Because the word had gone round that we had got the seal of approval from the big man. When I went back to England after being detained, I had another honorable honor of being invited by the Father Trevor Huddleston for tea. I was shaking because the cup was so tea and the tea wasn't warm. The tea was cold. And there sat this giant, wonderful man and said to me, thank you for the work. We notice and with you and we pray for you all the time. And these are the moments that stand out more than the awards, the recognition, lifetime achievements that my life have garnered throughout my career. But then you ask yourselves, what's the role of the arts? What mechanism? We come now to the 1990s. We hear that Nelson Mandela is about to be released. We hear that the declared government has decided to release. I said to myself, how dare do you have the right to release? You have no right to make that decision. You're falling under pressure. It is necessary. You are in serious trouble. You need these people. And it's exactly when we started to change gear in our struggle in within the arts, we thought, all right, where do we fit in now? Now the negotiations are taking place. And we asked even that when they were discussing in Cordes and Kempton Park, are there any artists present? So we could get an opportunity to put our case across so that we could also be part of the groundwork that would lead to the document that would free South Africa or make us a normal society. We waited for everything to come out and we then moved on into campaigning around the country. If in the government, the first cabinet of Nelson Mandela did not have a minister of arts and culture. It had a minister of sports. And then Mr. Ben Gubane was uh, uh, from the IFP, he was appointed minister of arts and culture, science and technology, with science and technology gained three quarters of the budget. And the other quarter of the budget took another 20% to 30% for running the entire office structure. So we were shortchanged from the beginning. I remember then having uh, uh, my play and 
I, I was the MC for the inauguration, uh, some uh, an, an event that took place in in in, at, in 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 Pretoria, the Union buildings. Nelson Mandela was receiving the Queen, so he said, "Come here, John. Come over here. Uh, tell me uh, how are things at the market." I said, "They're fine, Dad. It would just help us if we get some small assistance, so we could continue with our programs of educating, informing." of mobilizing our people, also of passing on this legacy to the next generation. But Deba said, hey, Mary Mkadana, come here. I want you to talk to John later. And suddenly I get a call from the minister who Ben Gwon says, why did you talk to the president? Did I ever say I'm not going to fund you? I said, no, he asked a question and I answered the question honestly. And that was the beginning. And immediately then in approaching the area of what are we going to do with voter mobilization? Because some of the farmers had told the farm workers that if you vote for the white man with the gray hair, not the one with the bald head, we will know. And then we were asked immediately by the structures to find a way to go to the rural areas and the communities to teach people about the secret ballot. I remember one moment we had somewhere uh, in the, towards KZN where we had about 40 people in the room and we took a basket and we put names, my name, and we put Ramla Makhene's name and said, now, here's a little piece of paper. If you vote for me, make an X here and put it in the basket. If you vote for Mr. Makhene, put an X there and put it in the bucket. When all these pieces were in there, we then sort of swelled them around and then we asked the people, come and get yours the one you put an X. When they rummaged on the basket and kept keeping these pieces off, they said, I can't find mine. And then another elderly Jamie says, so they will not know which one was mine. That was the role of the arts. That was the art, giving people education, giving people knowledge and information so that when the election comes, certain decisions are made. The same thing happened in 1995 with the Truth and Reconciliation. We went again to the to grassroots to explain why we needed this process. Why is Bishop Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and all these elders, why are they giving in?